Well, happy to be here this morning and to hear this uh, exhortation just as coming to the uh, platform. Sorry to be late, but sick in the back out there and, and car uh, ambulance-like, and, and uh, I had to catch those that couldn't get in, you see, before I could get in. Now, I wonder if the sister that's got the, the little fella, if she can't come back this afternoon, I want to preach this evening also, if the Lord willing. If she can't come back uh, for the dedication then, while we've been standing so long this time, well, tell her to she can bring the baby on now. But if she can come back th this tonight, it'll be a little better for us. But let whatever she can do, whatever it means, while she can't come back, we'll bring the little fellow now for the dedication. And now all these, uh, while I'm speaking, if she wants to come now, and this will be the time. Now, tonight, there is a very special, uh, I want to speak on the subject tonight, a prophetic message of, Sir, is this the time? So, if the Lord willing, I want to speak on that subject tonight. Is this the time, sir? Or, Sir, is this the time, rather? And then, um, I want to take this opportunity in the presence of the church, which there's been many things happened in the last few days that points up to a, a great something that I do not understand. But we're, we're always, God's ways are past finding out by man, so we just have to walk by faith. If anyone could explain God, then it would no more be necessary to have faith, because you, you know then. But we just walk by faith. And this morning I thought I would try to just have a regular evangelistic service because I kind of changed my thought after I got out here and seen so many standing and been waiting so long. And then tonight, uh, maybe be a less sure, and then I can uh, go ahead with this, what I want to say. One thing I'd like to announce while many of them are together, many of you together, it's uh, something that I've uh, refrained from announcing for the last couple of weeks, that is, your prayers has been answered concerning the tax case that I had with the government. It's settled. And so we are, it's, it's all over now. As many of you understand, what they had against me was those checks that had been made out for the campaign, and yet they tried to say they were mine out there and wanted to charge me $350-something thousand dollars for being my personal property. <laughs> And it wasn't. It was the campaigns. And the church knows about that. All of you know about it. And finally, they come to the place that... I'll just give you a little outline of what happened. They've been most three to five years, about nearly five years, I guess, in the case. And back and forth in character and everything. But I'm so grateful that they couldn't find anything against me, so they couldn't indict me for it. So there was nothing to be indicted. Only they said just my... My ignorance myself, I guess, but not knowing much about law, it'd bring me the checks. Now, I'd sign them, put my name on them, place them in the campaign, but then as long as I put my name on them, they were mine, you see. No matter. So that's very nice for you to uh, like that, but they were yours, and then you give them to the church. But as soon as you put your name on it, it was yours. No matter what this designated for, they were wrote to you. So if they'd been put on somebody to put across their personal gift, it would have been all right. But they just wrote William Branham. See, and when I put my name on it, that had done it. <laughs> it was all of it. So they was, and then finally with prayer, and then not long ago, you know, the, I had the vision that a great, dark, smoky, sooty, scaly, like an alligator man come moving towards me with iron fingers. I had one little knife like that, and it had on him United States government. <laughs> And I couldn't help nothing. I was helpless. And then the Lord came on the scene. And it was conquered. And you remember me tell you that long ago. And they offered a compromise the other day. And my attorney, Mr. Arbison in New Albany and Ison Miller in Indianapolis on the tax case, called me and told me to come down. And I went down, Brother Roberson and I and my wife and the trustees of the church here and all of us. We went down, and they told us that they were the government was willing to compromise. And I said, I, 
If I owe anybody anything, I pay them. But I, I do my best. But I said, I don't owe that. And so I said, I, I, it's honestly, God knows. And why don't they indict me then if I'm guilty? I said, they've had five years to try to do it, but they couldn't find nothing to do it with. So I said, no, I, ref- I just won't pay it until it's proved that I owe it. And then the attorney tucked me in and talked to him and said, now we can try the case. The government will try it. And said, when they do, the only thing they can find against you was that you, what I, what, the way I'd done it. I didn't just, I don't know nothing about keeping books, so I just had to do it the way I thought was honest. And it was never banked in my name. It was always banked in the name of the church campaign and so forth. See? So it wasn't nothing that I could do about it. And I, he said, well, they are willing to compromise for $15,000 with ten thousand dollars penalty and the attorney's fees was fifteen thousand. That made me forty thousand. <laughs> and so then they want five more, I think it is now. So I went I said, Where in the world would I ever get forty thousand dollars? And I said, You know my bank account here it's about a hundred dollars and maybe less. I said, Where would I get forty something thousand dollars? And I said, I have nothing for collateral. I I just haven't got it. That's all. And he said, Mr. Branham, he said, here's what it is. If we try the case, he said, there's no doubt but what we can beat the case. He said, but here's by, uh, we can beat it because here's what I'll do. They're going to claim all that's yours because you signed your name to it. And they're going to claim it's yours. Though it was banked in the name of the campaign, church, Branham campaign, and then a church, and not one time could they find one cent that I ever spent on myself. That's the truth. God knows this man sitting right here now, been right with me all along. There wasn't one cent that I ever spent for myself. It's all for the kingdom of God, everywhere, ever check, everything else. But see that? But that don't matter. I, it was, I, it's supposed to be mine first, and then the church is the campaign. And um, they have a way of doing it, you know, all kind of a, escapes they can make. So then um, I said, well, I'm... I just won't do it. And he said, well, if we beat the case that way, because I'll, I'll declare them personal gifts. See? I'll declare it for the government, personal gifts. And said, then when I do that, all over $10,000 will be inheritance. And then you'll be right back in it again, and they'll hold you another five years, checking all them. See, when you write a check and go through the clearinghouse, they photostat copy of that check. Of course, I had all the checks, too. And it went through. So they said, that's where they get you right back again. And he said, another thing, Mr. Branham, if you ever are called into the government like that, under an investigation, no matter what you ever do, in the eyes of the public, you're a crook. See? So that's all. Look at this little Baptist minister down here in Mississippi. That little fella, a woman said that he come in and insulted her. And that man brought evidence from across the country and everywhere. He wasn't even around the city for days before the day or day after in so much that the judge wanted to turn back and have him to sue the woman for scandal. He said, let her go. And when that was put on a monitor test across the country, you know what happened? Seventy-five percent of the American people said, where there is smoke, there's fire. And that poor little fellow, just as innocent as I'd be or anybody else, will labor under that the rest of his days when he had nothing at all to do with it. I felt very bad for a while to think, uh, put my life to the kingdom of God to try to make people pay your taxes and do things and do what's right and make crooks become right man and had to be put up like I was a crook myself. I thought, what in the world have I did? And then it came to me and I looked in the Bible. Every man in the Bible, no exceptions, had ever had a spiritual office. If Satan couldn't get them on morals or something, the government caught them. Go right back to anywhere you want to, all the way down, Moses, Daniel, Hebrew children, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ died by the government, capital punishment, Paul, Peter, James the Great, James the Less, every one of them died under the government because it is every government is a seat of Satan. Jesus said so. The Bible says it. See, every government is controlled by the devil. There's coming a government who will be controlled by Christ, but that's in the millennium. But this 
these governments now, no matter how well we think they are, yet the back of them, they're, they're dominated by Satan. These kingdoms, he said, are mine. I'll do with them whatever I wish to. I'll give them to you if you'll worship me. Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord and him only shalt thou serve. And then I got discouraged. My wife's listening to me. I went on. I said, no, sir. I, if I owed it, I'd pay it. I do not owe it. And I'm just not going to pay it. That's all. I said, how can I pay it anyhow? So I went home, I said, meaty, wash the kid's face. <laughs> Get their clothes ready. I'm leaving. I said, they won't even, everything, it's just upside down. I said, what have I done? Tell me. I said, yet me, $40,000? You don't realize what that means to me. And she come in as a nice little wife would. I said, I'm leaving. She said, do you think that would do any good? <laughs> Prayed over it yet? Well, maybe I better pray again. Uh, goes back in. It seemed like it said to me a scripture. Always we want to watch the scripture, what God did about it, you see. And one day it was asked to him, you know, trying to, trying to accuse him to the government. They said, um, is it right for us free Jews to give uh, tribute or taxes to Caesar? He said, you got a penny? He said, whose inscriptions on it? said, Caesar said, then you give Caesars the things that Caesars. And the gods the things that's God. Now, I thought of that. I've turned over in the Bible and read it. Oh, uh, truly, Lord, that's right. <coughs> but this don't belong to Caesar. <laughs> this was yours. <laughs> it wasn't Caesar's. If it had been mine and I'd been had to pay more taxes or something, well, that would have been different. It belonged to Caesar, but this this is yours. See? And it, it didn't belong to Caesar in the first place. You know, he's always got to answer in the Word. I just read a little farther and he said, uh, Say, Simon... Uh, ha haven't you got a fish hook in your pocket? <laughs> you always carry a little fish hook and a string. And uh, I just made a deposit this morning in a fish bank down there at the, at the river, you know. said uh, he, I made a deposit, and the banker will certainly give up what he's got. Just go down there and throw the hook in the river, and when you get up the bank, open his mouth, you see. And he'll, he'll give out the coin. Let's not offend him. Don't bring offense to him. See? Go pay it, Simon. That'll be for me and you. I thought, true God, you got fish banks and everything else across the country. I don't know how it'd be done, but we went down. I got the brothers right here in the church that stood on my note, and I put a note in and got the forty thousand dollars and paid it all. I went home. I won't know where I wrote that check if they had ever come back on me again. I said, this is to say that I'm free from all taxes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, endorse that with me. It's sure going to be in a mess after that. I kept calling back to the bank to see if they'd do it. And finally, Bob told me, he said, Billy, they did it. I went and put my arm around the wife. I said, honey, I'm free. <laughs> what a feeling to be free. <laughs> and um, so... I can pay it back now. They made it real easy on me. I can pay it back at $4,000 a year. Now, I, I can't loaf anymore, folks. i got to get out and go to work. So I, I, it take me 10 years to pay it back. And uh, if, if the, Jesus doesn't come, and when, that, when he does, all the debts are settled in anyhow. See, so, and, uh, so I hope that you all, uh, your prayers, and tonight I'll continue on with something just a little to that, but your prayers is what helped me. Thank you so much. God bless you. No matter where we ever at, I'll never forget that. <coughs> Tonight, if the Lord willing, I wish to state some of the facts that I know. And be sure to come. Now, remember, sirs, what time is it? Now, we're going to, uh, I believe they got a full schedule for the rest of the this week. And Monday night is a, a services tonight, today and tonight and Monday. Monday night is the watch service. And, um, and then that gives you Tuesday, New Year's Day, if you're out of town, can go back home. And we have some fine ministers here now for that meeting. We, uh, a great group of fine speakers. And everybody will be speaking uh, interviews uh, down on until midnight. And sometimes they take communion if it's uh, in line. I don't know where they are this time or not. Right as where they're hooping and hollering and 
shooting and drinking and going on, we take the communion. Amen. Start Amen. the New Year's right with the communion. Now, you're all invited, and I hope that your God of the heavens will give you an opportunity to stay over, if you can. Now, before we approach the Word, I want to say this, too, that I certainly thank this church, uh, its members, for this fine suit of clothes that you bought me. Thank you very much. That's so much to me. All your cards and things to the the Christmas seasons and gifts that you sent to the family. and oh, I, They were innumerable to me and little spots that cannot touch the spot in my heart. <laughs> Nothing could do it like that to know that it come from you. And so some of them sent me some other uh, Christmas gifts and money. And um, some of them sent uh, such a, One brother sent me a pocketbook. And uh, uh, it had made with my name on it. And a little a pen that you look through. And it's got a large prayer in it. And all things like that. It just, we just treasure. Wife and I and the children want to tell you thanks so much. Amen. It's so little. But I'll say this. This is the greatest word I think that anyone could say. God bless you. There's nothing Amen. to be any greater. Now, and to uh, these brethren here at the church who bought me that rifle. I, I wore my suit, but I, I couldn't bring the rifle to church. But it was... They really would have had something against me then. But, so I, I, I certainly thank you, my brethren. And I was going to read their names on a little... But one of the brethren was up yesterday. He said, oh, don't, don't, don't thank me, Brother Brandon. <laughs> Just take all the joy out of it, see. So I thought maybe the rest of them might think the same thing. But I got your name. They typed it out. I'll always remember it. And the Lord bless you greatly. And you know what I relax at? And just go in that den room and sit there and live all over. When I get so wound up, I can't go no farther than think about some hunting trip I took somewhere. Somewhere went fishing. I appreciate that. God bless you. Now, can we bow our heads just a moment as we approach the Word? I'm sure there's requests in here this morning. Too numerable to numerate just now. Well, I wonder, while we have our heads bowed, your special request. If you just keep it on your heart and just raise up your hands and say, God, you know what I'm thinking of now. Lord Jesus, you see every hand. And you know what's behind that? Down beneath that hand lays a request. And we are coming now reverently up to the throne of the living God. That great white pearl that stretches across the space of time. Where Jehovah God sits in there and the blood of Christ laying upon the altar. And we speak across that blood. By him that said, ask the Father anything in my name, it'll be granted. Won't you hear God this morning and answer their request? I lay my prayer with theirs today that you'll grant it. Your handkerchiefs laying here, Lord, that sick and afflicted. And we're taught in the Bible that they took from St. Paul handkerchiefs and aprons. And they were placed upon the sick and Unclean spirits went out of them and diseases departed. And fathers, we have known for a long time and we surely know that we're not St. Paul. But after all, we feel that it wasn't St. Paul. It was the Christ that was in him. And you are the same yesterday, today, and forever according to the Scripture. Now, these people, Lord, believe that if we ask, God, and take these handkerchiefs and lay them upon their sick, that they shall recover. I pray that it will be so, Lord. When these handkerchiefs are placed upon the sick, that is it said one time, Israel, starting in the line of duty, going to the promised land, and the Red Sea cut them off, right in the path of duty. But God looked down through that pillar of fire with angry eyes. And that sea got scared, and it rolled back its waves its waters, and Israel went through on dry land to the promised land. Now, Lord, today look through the blood of Jesus, and you see this act of faith that we're performing here this morning, 
And may Satan get scared and move away. And may each one of these pilgrims that's present and each one that these hangshots will lay upon, may they, the road be opened up, the sickness moved away, and may they journey on towards the promised land, being led by the Holy Spirit, the pillar of fire. Grant it, Lord. Now, bless the services, the words, the context, the reading, and may the Holy Spirit take the word this morning and sweetly divide it to each one of us, Lord, as we're growing close to some great tremendous something that we know not what. Our hearts are moved strangely, Lord. And we pray now as we reverently approach thee and thy word that you'll interpret to us the meaning thereof, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now tonight, don't forget the, the time. What time is it? And now, this morning, I wish to turn, you two have your Bibles or mark it, if you care to, in the Scriptures, where we want to speak from uh, for a few moments. Found in the book of Acts, we might read two or three places. Uh, Acts 26, 15 first. Acts, the 25th chapter, and the 15th verse to begin. Then we want to read Acts 23, 11. And you might add with this, if you wish to, I probably won't have time to read it, of Philippians 1.20. It's all about the same course, the same words. Now, in the book of Acts 26, 15, we reads like this. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Arise. And stand up on thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in thee which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O Grippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coast of Judea, and them, then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. And Acts 23, and the 11th verse, again, and the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of a good cheer, Paul, for thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem. So must thou bear witness also at Rome. May God add his holy blessings to the reading of this uh, most gracious holy word that we have before us. Now, I was hearing a man speak or talk not long ago, and he used the word absolute. And I thought that's a very fine word. I hear it used so many times. Absolutely. That's uh, looked up in the dictionary, Webster's. According to Webster's, <coughs> it's perfect in itself, unlimited in its power. Primarily an ultimate. And an ultimate is the Amen. That's all. Amen. Uh, absolute. It is it's the 
unlimited in power, the word absolute. It's, it's perfect in itself. That's all of it. That settles it. And I thought, that's a glorious thing. That's a wonderful word. And now, a word is a thought expressed. First, it must be a thought, and then it becomes a word because you do not speak your words without thought. When we speak in tongues, we have no thought. It's God taking the thoughts. It's God's thought using our lips. We don't think or know what you're saying when you're speaking in tongues if it's inspired speaking. When you interpret, you do not know what you're saying. You just say it. It's all. That's God. And prophesying, you're not using your own thoughts. It's God. Because you say things that you ordinarily wouldn't think about saying. But the word absolute is an ultimate. And therefore, I think that everybody should have an ultimate and every great achievement that's ever been achieved, there has been an absolute behind it. No matter what it was, it's had an absolute behind it. And every person, in order to achieve something, has to first have the absolute. And that's the final wind back to this, that, back to the other, till you come to that absolute. Or the uh, amen. Or the uh, ultimate of what you're... You got something you have to tie to, in other words. It's the final tying post to ever achievement. It's somewhere it might wind through many different things till it gets to that tie post. But there is the amen to all of it. There must be such a thing. You cannot go on through life without having one. You, when you got married, there had to wind back to your mind something till you hit that tie post. And it should have been love for your wife or your husband. Well, maybe she isn't as pretty as John's wife, or she what was she not the the this, that, but there's something about her that you it strikes you. You you, you say she might not be as pretty as the other, or he might not be as handsome as the other. But there has to be a absolute there that that person's different. And there's where you hold on to. If that isn't there, you better not get married. That tie post. That absolute. We can think of many who had absolutes in the Bible. Oh, how we could take down to the stream of that Bible and just be here two weeks from now and never even touch the surface if we think of the absolutes in the Bible. For instance, let me just call one or two, just brief them. Look at Job. Now he had an absolute. Everything went wrong for that man, a just man. Now we would be daring to say that he wasn't just because God said he was. There was no one on earth like Job. He was perfect in the sight of God and he knew it because he had an ultimate. He had an absolute. When everything seemed to be contrary, sickness broke out. His friends might have said, Now, there you are, Job. That proves that you are sinning. You're wrong. And then the bishops come down. Uh, they called them Job's comforters. And instead of comforting them, they seen nothing but sin in his life because God had dealt with him the way he had. And his children was killed. His, his property was burned. His, his, everything went wrong and even his own life in jeopardy. Sitting on an ash heap broke out from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet with boils. And even his lovely, sweet companion, 
the mother of those children said you should curse God and die of the dead. But in the face of all that, Job had an absolute. Amen. Oh, in a time of sickness, if we could only tie ourselves to that absolute. Amen. Job know that he had done Jehovah's bidding and he had faith in what he'd done because Jehovah required it. If we can just do that. Jehovah required a burnt offering for his sin. And Job, not only for himself, but for his children, had made a burnt offering. And that's all God required. Oh, you might say, I wish that's all he required today. It's less than that. Just faith in his word. And you, if you make his word your absolute, you can... Any divine promise in the Bible, you can tie your soul to it. No matter how much the waves whip you around, you're still tied. You're absolute. And he held on to it. And when this comforter said, you've sinned, he knew he had not. He was just because he had done Jehovah's bidding. And when he's, uh, every, the man come in and said, your children's dead. Another would come in and said, your camels are all burned up and there come fire down from heaven. Look what an argument is discomforters had. You see, the fire came from heaven. Now, Job, that proves. It proves nothing. Now, he wouldn't have struck your children, Job. You're a just man. But Job said, I know that I've done what's right. He still held on. He had something that he could drive down. Amen. That's it. He had accepted it. It had done exactly what God told him to do. And he was absolutely sure. All right. Then when he come to the spot, when that absolute help, then finally he began to feel the strain tighten up. They had been running loose, bouncing around. But it began to tighten up and the Spirit come on him. And he stood up being a prophet. And he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. Amen. Amen. See, he tightened up to his absolute. He had come in contact. He knew that he had done what was right. And someday he had to pull to it. Amen. I know my Redeemer liveth. And at the last days he stands upon this earth. Though hath the skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Amen. He knew that. Then his absolute Anchored. Abraham, an absolute, coming down from Babylon, from the tower, and the, out into the Shinehar, and out in there where he was uh, sojourning with his father, and perhaps as a farmer. But one day, way back in the jungles, somewhere maybe picking berries or, or going to kill a beast for his meat. And somewhere back in there, God spoke to him when he was 75 years old. And he, was, he and his wife, Sarah, her being 65, were childish, childish. They didn't have any children. Then God told him, you're going to have a child by Sarah. But in order to do this, you've got to separate yourself. God's promises are always on condition. You must absolutely, no matter how fundamental you are with the promise, it's under conditions. Always. How we could stop here and wave through that scripture back and forth for hours. See, that the condition is what means something. You can be just as fundamental as you want to, but it's under conditions by the promise. Predestination and so forth. Notice, now Abraham... He believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now, what a, a horrible thing it would be to meet a, a civilized world, a man 75 years old with a woman 65 and lived together since they were young couples because she was his half-sister. And now, going to have a baby bar. But he had an absolute. There was nothing going to move him. And 
when the first month it didn't happen, his absolute health, because he knew he had talked to God. The second month, second year, ten year, and at twenty-five years later, when he was a hundred, and Sarah was ninety, his absolute still health. And the Bible said when his obituary was written, he said, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong, giving praise to God. Why? Did you ever think why? He was absolute positive. And the only thing he had to do is separate himself from his people. God never did bless him until he did it. He took his daddy. The daddy died. He took Lot. And when after Lot separated from Abraham, then God come to him. So now walk through the land. Obedience, promise under conditions. Always goes with God and His Word. Now, look at, let's take Moses. Moses, uh, the runaway servant prophet. And God had raised him up and educated him and Pharaoh's palace. And, and Moses went out with his theological training and was the first man he slew. Then the first little defect come along. Then Moses was scared to death. Why? He had no absolute. He only had his, his mother's testimony of his birth. He was a strange child. He had his mother's word about it. He had the scrolls that God had, perhaps in paper somewhere they had written, packed along with him, that God was going to visit his children. He knew that that was a time, like we do now. Amen. We know something's fixing to happen. Amen. Now, Moses knew that was the time. And he knew that he was chosen for it, but he didn't have an absolute. See? And one day, on the backside of the desert, when he'd lost the vision, God appeared to him in a burning bush. And he said, Moses, I have seen the afflictions of my people. I've heard their groans and crying of those taskmasters punish them. I have remembered my promise. I've come down to deliver them. Now I'll go down to Egypt. Oh, my. Said Moses complaining, said, I don't speak very well. My, my deliverance is not very well. They won't believe me. He said, what's in your hand? He said, a stick. He said, throw it down and turn to a serpent. He said, pick it up with a tail and turn back again to a stick. He's given him the assurance of vindication. When God gives an absolute, He gives a vindication to that absolute, always. Then Moses, when he was down there and he threw down his stick before the magicians and Pharaoh and the magicians come and threw down their stick too. Moses never run and said, oh, well, I was wrong. I was just a cheap magician trick and maybe I was wrong. But he knowed. Amen. He was positive that he met God. And he stood still. That thing he had done exactly what God told him to do. So Job done exactly what God told him to do. Amen. Moses had followed his commandments. Then stand still and watch the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Moses is tied to his absolute, his commission. And he stood still. And when he did... His serpent swallowed up the rest of the serpents. See, he was tied to that absolute. God said, when you deliver them children, you'll worship me again on this mountain. Now the enemy, in every way that he can, will try to get you away from that absolute. Right as they started out of Egypt, they got cornered right in the neck of the, of the Red Sea. Mountains on either side. Come up through a valley. And there's the Red Sea. No way to escape over the hills. No way to escape this way. And Pharaoh's army coming this way. What a place to stand. See how the devil gets you? In a place where you don't know what to do. But remember, if you're tied to that absolute, that's got it. Moses know that God promised him that you'll worship on this mountain when you bring him out. And I've come down by your hand to deliver him and place him over in that other land. 
He stayed right with it. And God sent an east wind and blew out the waters out of the bottom of the sea and they walked across on dry land. An absolute. Amen. How we could go through the scriptures. Daniel, his absolute. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their absolute. David, his absolute. All absolute. Paul had one too. The one we are reading about. He had a Christ-centered call. Amen. And that was his absolute. That's the reason he wasn't afraid of what Agrippa would say. Stand there and Agrippa was a Jew as we know. And so and when he's standing before these kings and things, God had already told him he'd stand there. So he had an absolute, so he told exactly the heavenly vision. He said, I'm not a, I wasn't dishonorable to it. I was, did not misjudge it. I didn't misbehave myself. But he held to and was not disobedient. He carried it out to the minute. Amen. For it was an absolute. And any Christ-centered life, that's your absolute. Amen. Now, since meeting him face to face on the road to Damascus, that was meant so much to Paul. Now remember, he was a scholar beforehand. He was a mighty man in the scriptures. But he didn't have any tie post but the Sanhedrin that would back him up and a, and a diploma from uh, a, a great teacher. He was a great man in his field. But he was waiting only thing he had, his absolute would only be as strong as his organization was. That's all the stronger he could be. And he was working faithful to that. And was taking Christians and binding them and making havoc of them and even stone Stephens. I think later in his life, the reason he went to Jerusalem when the prophet told him, Don't go up there, Paul, for chains and prison waits for you. And Paul said, I know it. But I'm not only going to Jerusalem as a witness, but I'm going there. I'm ready to die for Jesus Christ. For he knew what he had done, and his ambition was to seal his testimony with his own blood. Die a martyr because he killed one of God's martyrs. And now he was on his road down to Damascus with all of his education. Said her that great teacher Gamaliel, and how that he had been taught in all the Jewish religion. And yet, with all that, he was flimsy and he did not have the ability to do certain things. And all of a sudden, there was a light and a roar, maybe in a thunder. And he was smitten and fell to the ground. And he looked up. There was a light shining that blinded his eyes. And what a strange thing that was. No one else saw the light. Just saw. It was so promise, so real to him until it blinded his eyes. He couldn't see. Totally blind with that pillar of fire blazing him right in the face. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. Amen. It's hard for you to kick against these pricks. Rise now and go into Damascus, and there one will be sent to you. Then when he raised up from there, and there was one, a prophet down in the city, who saw in a vision while he was praying, and he came, and an ice came and come in to Saul, laid his hands upon him, and he was healed by divine healing. He rose and was baptized, washing away his sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, and then he had an absolute... Amen. He was never the same after that. He went straight from church to church, from place to place, trying to build up that which he had tried to tear down. How the nation, how the Christian world this morning needs that type of absolute. Amen. Those who treat creeds and traditions has tried to, with doctrine of man to dis qualify God's Word to being the same yesterday, today, and forever. They need an absolute, an experience of meeting on the Damascus road, the living God who can heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out. A genuine, absolute. Hallelujah. Paul knew that something happened. 
There was no one could take it away from him. Nothing else mattered. He was tied. And that was it. No matter what come, he knew he was tied. Christ-centered life. Oh, the life that he had lived was a different life. Now, remember, he had been a religious man. And as some of you people this morning, and I know you realize that this tape is being made, will play in every nation under the heavens, about, around the world. And some of you people who's here present, and some of you out where the tapes will be played in the other nations by an interpreter, giving it to the tribes of Africa, back in the Hottentots, and, and all around... And you religious leaders who just got an education of the Bible, you've got it from a historical standpoint and may be able to explain all these things. But if you haven't got an absolute, Amen. haven't got a, an experience, Amen. and if that experience that, that you claim you have makes you deny that every word of this isn't just as true to the church today as it ever was, and you're trusting upon your uh, Bachelor of Art degree or whatever you might have. If you're trusting upon the thoughts of your organization that would say the days of miracles is past and we have no divine healing and the baptism of the Holy Spirit like they received on the day of Pentecost is not for the people today. If that's all you've got, my precious brother, sister, you need a Damascus Road experience. Amen. You need to meet this living God. Amen. Were you not only just a mythical thought in your mind, not some shiver or some kind of a sensation, but a talk and experience of a real genuine, the same Jesus that walked in Galilee is a living today and alive forevermore. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. An absolute that you don't have to take what anyone says. You know for yourself. Not some sensation. And if the sensation that you've had and somebody, it might have been a real Bible sensation. And somebody tried to explain it away from you, saying those things were in some other day. Be careful. It is true. Be careful. But there is a way to know. Amen. Test it with the Word. Amen. That's the blueprint. Amen. If the house goes up contrary to the blueprint, the contractor will tear it down Amen. and rebuild it. But it's got to go to the blueprint. Amen. No matter what your experience is, then, if something in you tells you that that Bible isn't true, that power of God Apostles, prophets, and teachers, and pastors, and the gifts of the Spirit just isn't the same as it was when it flowed to them. Apostles at Pentecost, there's something wrong with your absolute. Amen. It has to tie to a denominational creed instead of God's Bible. Amen. When he said, both heavens and earth will pass away, but my Amen. word shall Amen. never fail. Amen. Watch what your absolute is. You might be absolutely sure that you're in good fellowship with the pastor. It might be absolutely sure that you're in fellowship with the district presbyter. It might be absolutely sure that you're in fellowship with the bishop or some other great man in your church. But if you're not, your absolute isn't Jesus Christ. For upon this rock, how but my absolute. Amen. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. Spiritual revelation of who he is Amen. and knowing. All right. Oh, now. When you become like Paul, have the same absolute that he had. A Christ-centered life is a different life than what you once had. And it might be a very religious life that you live. Oh, I've heard people say, now, they're very religious. That don't have one thing to do with it. I've just seen many religions, very devout, many times more sincere than the Christian people that the day profess. When a mother can take her little fat black baby about that long and throw it into the mouth of a crocodile for the love of her God, I wonder how sincere Christianity is. When a man can afflict himself in such a way with 
put in a thousand hooks through his flesh like that, hanging with balls of water, holding him down like this, and walk through a streak of fire from here to the end of that tabernacle, back and forth, and hit white hot fan like that for the sacrifice of his God, an idol there with ruby eyes in it and so forth. I wonder where Christianity is. <laughs> so don't think sincerity. Sincerity is not it. Sincerity is all right if it's placed on the right thing. Like a doctor giving medicine, he might give you arsenic, sincerely. And he might give you sulfuric acid. Sincerely, you might have your prescription filled wrong. And you might take it in sincerity. But that don't save your life, see. No, sir, you've got to know what you're doing. And anything contrary to God's Word, I don't care what it is and how long it's been in existence, it's still wrong. Amen. Amen. Peter gave them an eternal prescription Amen. on the day of Pentecost. He said, repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this prescription is to you and to your children, and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory. That's right. It's an eternal prescription. Now, some quack druggist could get a hold of that and kill you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Certainly. You know, there's so much poison in a prescription. The poison, the germ. And uh, the doctor knows just how much can, your body can stand. The over poison, it would kill you. If you haven't got enough of it, then what would it do? It would do you no good to take the medicine. He knows what your body can stand. Now, that's the way this prescription of God is. No matter how much somebody else says it must be done this way or that way, don't you believe it? Amen. Amen. When you follow the word exactly to the letter, that's it. Amen. Amen. Right. Hold on to it. Now we've got the, those who say you must be sprinkled. They got those who so say you must use the titles of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's no such things in the Bible. No such place anybody was ever baptized in the Bible any other way besides the name of Jesus Christ. That's a dogma that was added in the Roman Catholic Church and carried down through traditions. We'll hit that tonight. But notice, in the midst of all that, the prescription remains. Amen. That's why we've got so many sick children because they're not listening to what the doctor said. Amen. The absolute, Amen. when you've tied to that, that's it. That's God's Word. It cannot fail. Christ-centered life. Very religious, but it wasn't Christ-centered. So many of us have that today. And when you get this, Christ-centered life, it makes you do things you ordinarily wouldn't do. It makes you act different than ordinarily you would act. I don't mean act silly. I mean act in the Spirit. Something that's real. Something that's genuine. And when you see somebody acting silly, you know they're only putting on something. They're only kind of impersonate where that genuine thing is. When you see a bogus dollar, remember there's a good dollar it was made off of. Hallelujah. When you see a bogus, it's absolutely uh, off shadow of something that's real. Amen. It's uh, something that, that is genuine, is copied off of. Notice, it makes you do things ordinarily you wouldn't do. Oh, it, it is something you are certain, you are very certain of it when you get this absolute. You're positive of it. You don't take what somebody else has experienced. That's the reason Christianity has become like a little kids in the Bible, uh, and not, excuse me, a little kids in school. They try to copy one off the other. And if that guy's wrong, the whole thing's wrong. See, you've got the whole bunch of them wrong. Amen. Oh my, don't copy. Meet him yourself. Amen. A good friend of mine standing back there is, an old, is a son of a buddy of mine, a lifelong friend, uh, a little Jim Poole. Well, his daddy and I were growing up together in school. And, oh, what a fine fella. Uh, little Jim and I are praying constantly that Big Jim will become a Christian, a, a real believer. And uh, little Jim and I were talking yesterday about where we found God in the woods and seen him in nature. That's where you find him because he's a creator and he's in his creation. And I remember Jim and I used to go... Uh, uh, go, want to go hunting. And when night come, well, we used to go down, take our bicycles, and ride right down the street here, scared to death to pass the graveyard after it got dark, and go down and get us an ice cream cone. And Jim liked to shoot pool. Now, we're just boys, 10, 12, 14 years old. 
And then Jim liked to sit around and read storybooks of hunting and trapping. And I would sit around and daydream. See? About, and now some of the boys can see me. And I'd see a little bitty shack somewhere. And I used to say, boy, that would be a good shack to have in the mountains. And I always dreamed that someday I'd have me a shack in the mountains, a big bunch of hounds and, and some guns. And I always thought if I could own a 30-30 some of my time. Thought, how in the world would I ever own a little 30-30 rifle? And the other day, standing looking on my wall, and seeing there some of the best rifles that can be gotten. I thought, amazing grace. I thought, I'll train myself to shoot and shoot good. And then maybe sometime to get take a trip into the mountains, some good hunter will take me along just to be kind of a, cause he wanted to protect his life maybe from a charging bear. He wasn't too sure some rich man would take me along just to uh, go along with him kind of a bodyguard. Maybe someday I'd get to hunt in Africa as a bodyguard. If I could just train, that's the only thing I can do is train to be a good steady shot. Oh, I thought, God, think of you letting me hunt over the world. What a wonderful thing. Jim used to sit and read the book. And I said, Jim, he said, I, I, I like to read about it. I said, Jim, that's what somebody else done. I want to do it myself. I want the experience. When I come to Christ, I couldn't take somebody else's experience. I wanted it myself. Amen. Amen. I remember when I read Zane Gray's Lone Star Ranger. I tore up two or three brooms for mama. <laughs> riding around the house. A galloping when I was on this uh, hobby horse broom. Uh, I read that story of, of the Lone Star Ranger and how he brought the uh, justice to the, the Big Ben. Then I read Edgar Rice Boer's fiction story of Tars and the Apes. Mother had an old fur rug, a seal skin rug or something, and Mrs. Waffen had given her from the fire. And it laid on her room, and I, I, I tucked that rug out. Mama doesn't know the wind is blowing out. And I tucked it out and cut it up. It made me a Tarzan suit and stood up in a tree. I lived half my time in a tree hiding this Tarzan suit because I had seen what he done. I wanted to do it too. Amen. But one day, by the grace of God, I got a hold of the real thing. Amen. Amen. My song and story has been to be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him. Amen. I don't want to be a bishop or, a, or some great fellow in the church, some pope or some priest. I want to be like Jesus. Amen. 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 An absolute. It makes you different. There's something about it to read his word and something in your heart you long to be like him. You're certain. It's like the absolute to the Christ, the absolute to the Christian, is like the um, it's it's like the anchor in the ship. Yes, uh, you you got to have an absolute, and if Christ is your absolute, it's like the anchor that when you the sea is very rough, and the ship is about ready to sink, and you only one hope you have is cast anchor, and then if the ship is tossing. See, if the anchor will hold the ship. You know, we got a song. I forget the author's name now, but my anchor holds. Amen. Amen. Like the little boys we've many times thought, flying the kite. You couldn't see nothing, but he had the string, and a man passed by and said, What are you doing, son? He said, I'm flying my kite. He said, What you got in your hand? He said, The string. He said, Where's the kite? He said, I don't see it. Well, how do you know you're flying a kite? He said, I can feel it. It's a covenant. Amen. See, at the end of that string, there was an absolute. Amen. To his little way, that kite was his absolute, so he could say he was flying a kite. Though he couldn't see it, but he had a hold of something that had a hold of it. Amen. That's the way a man, when he's born again of the Holy Spirit, Amen. He's got a hold of something. He's got an anchor out Amen. under him. And the storms doesn't shake him. He knows he's all right. He's anchored. All right. Now, if we are in our little bark, floating across life's solemn main, as the great poet said, 
that life is not an empty dream and the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Life is real and life is earnest and its grave is not its goal. For dust thou art, the dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Amen. Oh, I think that's so pretty. Now, a long fella wrote that psalm of life. See? While sailing over life's solemn main, for forelong and shipwrecked, brother, in seeing shall take heart again. Amen. Now we are embarked, sailing life's solemn main, and Christ to this ship upon the storms of time, when the storms get heavy and they're pitching about, I'm glad I got an anchor that holds within the veil yonder somewhere. Amen. Even death itself cannot rock you away from it. You are tied to your absolute. Amen. Christ is our anchor. What is He? He is the Word. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. Then when we know that our actions is exactly with the Word. We know our teaching is perfect with the Word. Adding nothing or taking nothing. Just the Word. And we see the same results. That others who anchor to the same word living up in our life, then your anchor holds. The life of Christ being reproduced in almost an incarnate way through you as it was in Christ because it was God in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. And you see God in yourself holding that same keel on the word, just exactly the way Jesus did. You see His life, the works that I do shall you do also. He that believeth, not him that maketh believe. He that thinks he believe, but he that believeth. Amen. Amen. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he also. Why? He's anchored to the same rock. What was the rock? The Word. Amen. Always. You're anchored there. It's your north star when you're lost at sea. You know, we've got a lot of stars, but there's only one true star that don't move. That's the north star because it sets in the center of the earth. No matter where you're on the backside, upside, or wherever you're at, that North Star is just the same. It's your North Star. Now, you see, there's a lot of stars that shift from place to place. But if you're in a, on the sea, while well, any seaman knows, or any hunter that roams the woods knows that your North Star is your, is your place, that's all. Then, it's like your, your, your compass. Your compass won't point to Mars or Jupiter or somewhere. It'll point to the North Star. Why? That's your absolute. Oh, my. Notice, your absolute. Oh, I'm going to say something. I just feel it coming on. Notice, I feel very religious at this time. Because this is assurance. Notice, your compass can only point to the North Star. Amen. That's the only place it can point. Amen. If it's a true compass, it'll strike the North Star every time. Amen. Is that right? Amen. Then if you have the Holy Spirit, it can only point to the Word. Amen. Amen. It'll never point to a denomination. Amen. It'll never point to a creed. Amen. It'll never point it away somewhere. It'll point straight to the Word. Amen. 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 I feel like shouting. Amen. Notice. It's, it's something inside a man pulsating when you see your star setting out yonder Jesus Christ, the Word. And you see the Spirit that's in you won't let it move right or left. Amen. 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 That's the only one that can He come to take the things of God and to show them, manifest them. And Jesus said, He'll do just exactly the things that I say. He'll reveal to you things that is to come. Show you ahead of time before it gets here. See? He'll take the things that are mine and will show them to you. And then He'll show you things that is to come, John 15. We see that He shows the things and He takes the things that are God and will show them to you. And He will reveal to you the things that Jesus said. In other words, He'll make plain the thing. Place that way over the corner tonight. Because that's what we're going to use a little while. Making sure. Making that positive. See? Then you know if you are a North Star, which is the word to any Christian. 
Anything contrary to the word? Look, let me tell you something. Listen to this closely. This is the complete divine revelation of God, His will, and the coming of Christ and everything lays right in this book completed. Amen. Amen. And if anything draws you off of that, throw that compass away. Amen. Amen. Because it's only a creed. It's only a, it's only a paper that you're packing in your pocket. You've got to hang it in your room frame. It's a creed. Then find the compass that sets you to the Word. Amen. 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 You know, when this experience hit Paul, he went out in Egypt and Arabia somewhere and studied three years. Glory! He had to be positive. And when he seen, when the Holy Spirit directed him word by word, he could write that book of Hebrews and show those shoes. Certainly, why? He was centered that compass of the Holy Spirit put him right on the North Star. Amen. Now, if you got something pulling you off of it, you better leave it alone. Yes, right. wow. Son, it'll point to His Word and only to His Word because the Holy Spirit came to manifest or vindicate God's promise. Amen. There's no creed will do that. No organization will do it. No powers of nothing can do it. Only the Holy Spirit by the Word and he is the germ. Yeah. Now you take a grain of wheat, a pretty grain of wheat, but it can no, do nothing. It's dead until the germ comes into it. Then it produces many grains of wheat. Amen. And Christ is that life. Amen. That absolute. If the wheat doesn't have that absolute in it, it'll never rise. Right. If that wheat don't have that absolute, it may be ever so pretty on the outside, but it cannot live because there's nothing in it to live by. But when it gets that absolute, it can look in the face of all critics Amen. and say, I'll rise again. Amen. Why? Because it's got the absolute. It's in it. It's got to rise again. And when it, if ye abide me and my words abide in you, then ask what you will. That's that absolute. But if you got creeds and everything else tied up into it, you can't mix oil and water. You just take it and break it any way you want to. It'll never mix because it's two different chemicals. And you can't make creed and the Bible, contrary to the Bible, mix. You can't make denomination and freeborn religion or freeborn salvation mixed together. Because as sure God only deals... I'm going to say it in. God never breaks His program. Amen. He cannot break because it's infinite. Amen. And I realize, you know, uh, I, it goes for lots of people. See? But God cannot break His program. He cannot do something one day and change the order, do something, say it's wrong that day. Amen. God doesn't deal with groups of men. God deals with an individual because Amen. man has Amen. different ideas. He's built Amen. up different in nature. God has to take that man and mess him around and pull him around out of his own self to get him in his nature. Amen. 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 And then God deals with that person. Look, all down through the ages, Noah, Moses, the prophet, never two of them at the same time, one. Constantly, all the way down through the ages. Therefore, you say in the multitude of counsel, their safety. Look at it. It's a preacher not all go to the tabernacle. There was Ahab, and there was Jehoshaphat, and they were going up to Ramoth Gilead to push back. Fundamentally, they were right. The land did belong to them. And the the enemy, the Syrians up there, was filling their children's belly with the wheat that the Israelites should be God-given property. So fundamentally, it seemed good. Yeah. Go with me and go up there and we'll push them off the land. Well, that sounds awful good. Fundamentally, it was right. But it's conditioned. Jehoshaphat, being a good man, said, but shouldn't we consult the Lord? Of course, they had that backslider. said, well, sure, borderline believer, you know, said, oh, certainly I should have thought of that. I've got 400 Hebrew prophets. 400 of my feet take care of. They're the best there is in the country. We'll bring them up. And all of them together with one accord said, Go on up. The Lord is with you. Fundamentally, they were right. But they hadn't caught that absolute. Amen. Amen. Then when he said, Isn't there one more? He said, Yes, there's another one, but I hate him. He said, He's always telling evil about me. Always saying, How could he prophesy good? When the whole world Elijah, who had been before him, said to Ahab, the dogs will lick your blood. Amen. 
Now, how could that vindicated prophet say anything that wasn't the will of God? <coughs> how that the dogs would eat Jezebel and the dung would be up on the field so they could not say, here lays Jezebel. With a curse like that on a man, how could anybody else bless? Amen. That's the way it is. They, how can a man bless these things that's taking people further from God? Amen. 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 There's only one thing to do if you have to stand by yourself. Curse the thing in the name of the Lord. And stay with it. When you're absolute, you say, well, Brother Brandy, you make people hate you. God will love you. Amen. That's my absolute. Amen. You can't rest on an arm of flesh. You've got to rest on the Word. What God said to you. How did Micah know he was right? He waited he had a vision. They had a vision too. But the vision didn't compare with the Word. Amen. And today, the same thing. Micah compared his vision with the Word. And then he seen he and the Word was together. Today, if your vision's contrary to the Word, leave it alone. Because it's a wrong absolute. Micah's absolute was exactly with the Word. So he could stand and say he, what he said and, and believe it. When they smacked him in the mouth and said, which way did the Spirit of God go? He said, you'll find out when you set me in the inner chamber. Right? He said, when I return in peace, you put this man in the inner prison. And when I return in peace today, I'll deal with this talk. Oh, now, Micah, what about it? Your head will be chopped off when he comes back. Well, Micah stood there just as stern as Stephen's did. Amen. Amen. Just as willing as my Lord walked to the cross. Hallelujah. Just as easy as Daniel went into the lion's den. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the furnace. Absolutely, he stood there and said, If you return at all. Amen. Why, he was absolute. If you return at all, God never spoke to me. Chop my head off then. Hallelujah. He had an absolute. He knew that his compass that had guided him to this vision was exactly with the North Star. That's there. His anchor held. Yes, the word in it on him. If you're absolute, if you have an absolute in your life, there was a time when, you know, adequates had an absolute. I can't think of that woman's name, but the whole nation trusted in what that woman said. I forget her name. I was writing a note here. I couldn't think of that woman's name, uh, who what it was, but here a few years ago, they had to be, this woman, what she said, if she said, use the knife in the left hand, that was, that was it. That was the absolute. She was a, the answer to all of it. And if you put the fork in the left hand, then you were absolutely wrong. What was her name? Oh, that's it, sure. Yeah, that's it. Now, you were, you were absolute. She was, she was etiquette's n- absolute. It must be that way. Like, oh, many things we find like that. But we find out, now it's gone. Eat the way you want to. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. But that was uh, etiquette's uh, absolute. You had to do it that way. There was a time when Adolf Hitler was Germany's absolute. Whatever he said, when he said, jump, they jumped. When he said, kill, they killed. Millions of Jews, he dotted his head. You see what happened to that kind of an absolute? It looked like power, but it was contrary to the Word. Amen. How do you know it was contrary to the Word? God said, when Balaam tried to look down upon Israel, the curse that he said, I see him as a unicorn. Amen. Yeah, how righteous are thy tents? Uh, Whoever curses you will be cursed. Whoever Amen. blesses you will be blessed. Amen. Looked like Hitler could have saw that. Yeah. Looked like them German Christians could have saw that. Think that absolute, absolutely contrary to that word. You know, as it's been said, man, God made man, but man made slaves. One trying to rule over there, and we've got one ruler, that's God. But Hitler was Germany's absolute. Look at it today. Now, see what happened? It was a wrong absolute. Why? It was contrary to the word. And now, you see where it all went to? Disgrace. And if your absolute is in some organization or some sensation or something else besides the person of Jesus Christ, you'll come to the same potion of shame. Only worse. If your absolute is not Christ, that's the only center post of the human life. And Christ is the Word. 
Amen. Not your church, your word, the word. See, upon this absolute, I'll build my church. Upon Christ, the word. There was a time when Mussolini was the absolute of Rome. I don't know. I might have read an article. Or it could have been that I uh, read it in a book or somebody told me. But when someone was being interviewed by uh, a Mussolini, he was, he was going to bring Rome into uh, athlete, athletics. And uh, there's a big statue used to stand there of him uh, about athletics. That's all right. Greece had that idea many years ago. Rome's always tried to have it. Now, athletes, all right. But, but athletics, but, but remember, that won't take the place of Christ. Right. No matter how strong you are, that has nothing to do with it. He's the all power. Amen. And you see what he tried to build Rome upon? And he tried to build Rome upon the thing of an absolute, that he was that absolute. And they said that one day that his, uh, his, uh, ca- his uh, driver was one minute early and he shot him. So I didn't say be here at one minute before nine. I said be here by nine. Plow and shot him. I don't want you here one minute before. I want you here at nine. See? Look what an absolute. He tried to make himself. But you see what happened? You remember many of you here, the old timers, Roy Slaughter, maybe and farther back in that. Remember down there when I told you about prophecy? One day down there at the odd fellow's building before we ever come to here. I said, Mussolini will come to a shameful end. I said, his first invasion, he will go to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia will fall at his step, but he'll come to his end and nobody will help him. And disgrace will he be buried. There he is. I said, there's three isms as rose up. Nazism, fascism, and communism. I said, them isms will revolve and come around into one. It'll be communism. Watch communism will burn Rome. You watch it. Amen. <laughs> It's a tr- tool in God's hand. Amen. They think they're against God. They're working right into it all the time. Amen. Don't know it. He just used them as a puppet. <laughs> Some Amen. tool in his hand. Like he did Nebuchadnezzar. Many of the others. Now notice. See, now, there was a time when Pharaoh was the absolute of Egypt. But look where it's at now. See, they all failed. Oh, it's a wrong kind. So they always failed. They're a man-made absolutes. You can't take a man-made absolute. I don't care if it's a, a president, if it's a dictator, if it's a king, if it's a church, if it's an organization, if it's a creed. Any of those things are going to perish just like all the absolutes of that kind through the ages. We can look back. Look back. Look at man who trusted the emperors. Look at man who trusted the dictators. Look at man who built their hopes upon them kind of absolutes. And look where they are today. Now let's turn ourselves around and look at the man who put their hopes upon the Bible, upon God's Word, and Hallelujah. held it for an absolute. Look where they are now. Amen. Hallelujah. Paul gives you a little brief up in Hebrews 11 chapter. What they did. How they subdued kings, wrought righteousness, and so forth. And they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins of who the world's not worthy of. Waiting in glory for that grand resurrection. All right, for they, some of them didn't, didn't obtain to these miracles, and they give their bodies anyhow, looking forward to that resurrection. To finish out their lives, they didn't care for it. They wanted to go on and sacrifice themselves so they could obtain that resurrection, and that's what they did. Now, absolutes, we're talking. Absolute. You know, our Supreme Court is an absolute. It's an absolute, it's the, it's the final end of all arguments in this nation. That's right. Their decision is an absolute in our Supreme Court. That's right. Oh, well, I know sometimes we don't like it, but it's, it's an absolute anyhow. Yes, sir. What if we didn't have that? Then what? But that's an absolute. It certainly is. Uh, why? That's our nation is tied to that. When that Supreme Court finally makes their final decision, that's it. There's no for Where are you going to after that? You're going to follow their decision, that's all. You've got to. They're the last word. They're the amen. You can try it in local city courts. You can try it in magistrate and then go to federal, to, uh, all kinds of courts. 
and the federal courts, but when we come to the Supreme Court, that's it. Sometimes we don't like to say, well, I don't like their decision, but you try to get away from it once. (laughs) That's the nation's absolute. And what if we didn't have it? Yes, we have to have an absolute. Everybody has to have one. You got one. But what I'm trying to tell you is background there and show you what absolutes are. Now, the nation's Supreme Court is the nation's absolute. That's the last thing in any kind of fuss. They said it. What they say, that's it. There's an absolute in a ball game. That's the empire. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we don't like his decision either. But it's, it's, it's that anyhow. The empire. His decision is the final word. That's right. No matter what others say, if he says it's a strike, it's a strike. That's right. Certainly. No matter what others say, that don't have nothing to do with it. And uh, let's just think of, if you, I don't go to ball games, so just happen to jot that down. Uh, an empire. He's the absolute at the ball game. One of them say, that was the ball. The other say, you're a liar. They say, this is my way. He ought to be this way. The empire said, strike. <laughs> See the rest of them take their seat and sit down. <laughs> it gripes some of them, but <laughs> I imagine they'd boo at him down their heart and things, but uh, it'd strike anyhow. Amen. Why? He's a final word. First baseman said, You know that? That pass. He doesn't say, You know that? Song. He says, Strike. <laughs> That's all of it. <laughs> Shut up then. Go on back to your place. What if there wasn't an empire ball game? My, could you imagine what kind of a game that would be? One of them said, there's a strike, there's a this, and there's a that, and said, you're a liar, and there'd be a fuss and a fight. To have a ball game, you got to have an absolute. Amen. And he walks out there, and no matter if you don't like him or what, he's the absolute anyhow. He is the absolute. His word is final, no matter what you say about it. It's that way. Now, if they didn't, the whole game would go into chaos. Is that right? What would the nation be if it wasn't a federal court? If it wasn't a Supreme Court in this nation, what would it go? Where would it go to? The nation would be in a chaos. If there wasn't a if there wasn't any part of all game, it would wind up you wouldn't make the first throw and somebody would be fussing. Somebody stand there and maybe the really went right over the plate, and the other guy would say, Oh no, 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 it didn't do that, and then there you go. First ball was sold to argue about. One of them said, that was a strike. And I said, it wasn't a strike. See, you've got to have somebody that game's tied to. And that's the empire. When he says strike, it's strike. If he says ball, it's ball. Whatever he says, it goes. That's it. And if you didn't, you wouldn't have no game. Let me show you another absolute. There's a red light. A red light. When it says stop, it means stop. If you run it, you're going to pay for it. But if this city didn't have any lights out here, stop lights, what kind of a city would it be? Amen. It's got to have an absolute. Amen. I don't care what the policeman said or anybody else standing there. They're secondary. If somebody can prove that you went through on a green light, I don't care what the policeman said. They're wrong. When the light said go, that means go. That's the absolute. You can prove that. The light said go. The policeman might be standing somewhere. The mayor of the city might be somewhere. That'll make a bit of difference. If you've got proof that it was go, you go, and if somebody hits you, it's their fault. You can prove it. That's right. We can prove what we're talking about. Amen. Yeah, right. Now, what if there wasn't no red light? One run up to a crossing. Look what it would be. One say, hey, get out of the way. I'm in a hurry. i got to go to work. I'm late now. I'm going to now. They said, you just think you are. Because I am the one that's going through because I was here first. Now you can see a woman get out and fix her hair. <laughs> what if we didn't have her in? Wouldn't there be a traffic jam? That's what's matter at the churches. That's right. That's the reason we got such a denominational jam. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. Nobody's getting anywhere. They're standing fussing. Amen. Here is God's light. 
When it says go, go. When it says stop, this is for us and stop. That's right. That's where we are based upon that. That word. Not what some bunch of man said or some other bunch of man said. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them and believe. Amen. That's go. Amen. Go ye in all world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, as good as education is, but Jesus never required that. Amen. That's right. As good as churches are, buildings, he never required that. Amen. As good as hospitals was, we, the churches build hospitals. That's all right. We appreciate that, but he never required it. Amen. He said to the church, preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. And the gospel came not in word only, but through power and manifestation of the word. Amen. Paul said so. Amen. Then go manifest the gospel. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. Oh, if it was that way, oh, we are today living in a time when we got the best doctors we ever had. We got the best drugs we ever practiced with. You know that. And we salute those men. We pray for them. I do. And I hope you do. Uh, those men who with their uh, uh, understanding of Feeling, they got two senses to work by, that's seeing and feeling, and they and hearing. They work by a sound of a heart, or a, a feeling of a tumor or something, or um, uh, the sight of something they can see, a spread of disease, or, or something on the face, that's covering the face or the body somewhere. They, they work upon those things, see, because that's... And they, Try to take medicines and so much that'll kill it and then won't kill you and, and so forth. They, that's their business to work on that. And we appreciate that. That's very fine. But we got the best doctors, the best medicine, the best hospitals, and more sickness than we ever had. Amen. Amen. We got more unbelief than we ever had. Amen. Yes, sir. Exactly. Ministers has organized themselves and got great denominations and taking in anything and so forth and just for anything making a church member and they're one order some seminary like a incubator chicken and hatch them out by a, a grinder that brings them out like that and sometimes know them more about God than a hot and pot does about an Egyptian night. Come bring them through like that and the, there you are. See? Oh, what we need in our churches is a man that's got an absolute. Amen. What we need in a Methodist church, the Baptist church, the Pentecostal church, the Presbyterian church is an absolute, a man of God that'll stand tied to the Word and to Christ and bring that congregation under that condition or each member walks in condition of this Word, seeing that Word manifested, following these signs shall follow them to believe into all the world. Amen. They said that was done away with. Jesus said, go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. We haven't reached all the world yet in a long way from every creature. Amen. How long? All the world. Who to? Every creature. What will happen? These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. My name they shall cast Amen. out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If they should take up a serpent or drink the deadly thing, it would not harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's the absolute. Holding there the word. That north star, that compass that stays right with it. That's what we need. But we went out and built institutions, organized the people, tuck in members and fussed with the Baptists because they didn't believe the way we did and the Methodists because they didn't this way. And we hatched out a bigger seminary, built a bigger churches, a better plush pews, a bigger organ and so forth, and a better dressed crowd. We got the mayor and everybody in the church. And what do we got? A Amen. bunch of death tied to a denominational absolute. Amen. Death! Amen. Oh, far bit. If I die in my tracks, my absolute is Jesus Christ. Amen. Upon that's what I believe. If everybody walks out, someone said that, Dr. Davis said to me, Billy, you preach such a thing as that, you'll preach it to the post of the church. I said, I'll be preaching God's word to the post, and because God's able to post the right children of Abraham. Amen. Right? God's word is true. He said, you think they'll believe you? I said, that's not my business. It's my business to stay true to that Amen. word. Amen. Amen. That's right. Uh, so you think you can meet an educated world like this with a theology of, of divine healing? I said, it's not my divine healing. It's His promise. He was the one who gave the commission. Oh, and I remember when He swept down there in that big light standing here at the bottom of the river, 1933 in June, when He said, Has, Has John the Baptist was sent forth? 
Before I am the first coming of Christ, I send you with a message to the world to forerun the second coming of Christ. And around the world, she's went when revival fires have been built for 15 years on nearly every mountain. Amen. Divine healing across the nations and the power and restoration. Amen. Now I believe she's ready to strike that final climax. Now to bring forth a faith that will rapture the church in the glory. She's laying in the middle. Hallelujah. Really at the end now. Amen. They've talked about it and everything, but the thing has moved up on us now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Give one. That's right. The, the, the red light, as I said, it settles the case. That's all. The red light tells you who goes. Hallelujah. <laughs> no matter what anybody else says, it's what the red light says. <laughs> You can really have a traffic jam if you don't if you don't mind the red light. There must be an absolute. Yes, sir. Just like to the church, there's got to be an absolute. To the people in the church, you've got to have your absolute. But today, each church has its own absolute. <laughs> See, and don't try to take we Baptists believe this. We Methodists believe this. We Presbyterian believe this. We Pentecostals believe this. That's all right. But won't you take the rest of it? Amen. What's right with the rest of it? We Baptists believe in immersing. It's good. What about the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Amen. What about speaking with tongues? Amen. What about gifts of healing? Amen. What about prophecy? Amen. Oh, no. We don't. That, that was for another age. Oh, oh boy. Amen. Pentecostals, you say, well, we believe in speaking in tongues for the evidence. Sure. Speaking in tongues is all right. But that's still not the evidence. Amen. Many people speak in tongues. That's true. And that's as far as they ever go. Amen. The devil can impersonate any gift that's got. Amen. Any gift that's in the Bible. Paul said, Though I speak with tongue of men and angels, though I give my body to be burnt as a sacrifice, though I sell all my goods to feed the poor, and though I have faith to move mountains, though I went to the seminary and learned all the knowledge there is to be learned, I'm still nothing. Amen. It's the person of Christ. Amen. Christ! Receive Him, and you can't receive Him without receiving His Word. The Word has to come first, then the life comes into that Word and manifests that Word. Amen. Didn't Jesus say, if I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me? Amen. It was the Word of God being manifested. God was in Christ reconciling, expressing Himself to Amen. the world what He was. That, was. that was the absolute. Amen. That was the eternal absolute there. Now you say, is that the eternal, Brother Ram? That was. Then what about today? Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he also. Amen. The same absolute. All right. Each one has her own absolute. Oh, my. It's just like it was in the days of Judges. Every man done what was right in his own sight. In the days of Judges, every man had his own, his own absolute. He Amen. did just what he wanted to do. And that's the way it is now. Every man done right in his own sight. Now, you know the reason they did that in Judges? This might shock just a little bit. But the reason they did it in Judges because they had no prophet for the word of the Lord to come to. So every man could do what he wanted to in his own sight. And that's exactly what's happened today. We don't have the prophet in these days of denominations, but God promises one. See, He did. In the last days, he would rise up and send Elijah back on the scene again and he would turn the hearts of the children back to the faith of the fathers, back to the original Pentecost. You know he said that. Now, I know you'll refer, as he did there, to John over in, in Matthew 11, chapter, and uh, the sixth verse, I believe it is, when they said, who do you think this man was, this John? He said, if you can receive it, this is he that was spoken of. Behold, I send my messenger before my face. That's Malachi 3. Not Malachi 4. But remember, if that was the Malachi 4, then the word failed because he said, but just at this time, the whole world would be burnt. And the righteous would walk out upon the ashes of the wicked. <laughs> Don't mix it up, brother. Make it say Amen. just exactly what it says. Amen. That's right. He promised it in the last days. Amen. And it'll be right in the midst. Remember when judges, every man done the way he wanted, there was no man. No man could make that word live. There was no prophet. The word of the Lord always comes to the prophet. Amen. Right. And he's always hated. Amen. Only a little group that love him. 
And see, but I mean, there was always that. God doesn't change His policy. He cannot then be God. If God ever says anything or does anything, He must do the next time. When that crisis arrives, if He don't act the second time the way He did the first time, He acted wrong the first time. Amen. Amen. And who will accuse God of acting wrong? Amen. Who are you can lay sin to God? That's Amen. what Jesus said. Which one of you can accuse me of sin? Amen. What is sin? Unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. Amen. Which Amen. one of you can show me that I haven't fulfilled everything Messiah should do? Hallelujah. Nobody spoke a word. He had. The Messiah was a prophet. Amen. And he had proved that he was that. He had, had a prophet for hundreds of years Amen. since Malachi. And here he rose on the scene. He was a mystic to the people. And a stumbling block Amen. to the church. Because he said, Behold, I'll lay in Zion a cornerstone, a precious one, tried. Oh, a stumbling stone. Amen. Yeah. But whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That's right. There he was. And they just exactly fulfilled Scripture. But those who believed him had an absolute. Little Martha, when she seen Lazarus come from the grave, she knew who that was. Even before it done it, she had the absolute of knowing, I believe that thou art the Son of God that was to come into the world. Hallelujah. Even Amen. now, though my brother be dead, just say the word. Yeah. God will do it. Amen. Amen. She was absolutely positive. Yeah. That's right. When he said that, and she meant it from her heart, he said, where have you buried him? Yeah. There, come and see. There he stood there with a vision, because he said, I do nothing until the Father shows me first. St. John 5, 19. Sent him away from... Well, he went away from Lazarus' house. He sent for him to come pray. He knew Lazarus was going to die. And after the amount of time, he said, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. They said, He does well. He said, He's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. They've been asking him to pray for him. Then he comes back and said, But I go wake him. Oh, Amen. Amen. I'll go and see what I can do. <laughs> I'll go wake him. Why? The Father's already showed me just what to do. Went down to the grave. There stood a man. There stood God in flesh. Amen. That could have said to that stone, dissolve, and it would have dissolved. But he said to them women, and poor little women, little young women, said, take away the stone. Yeah. You got something to do too. See. And they rolled away the stone, and it made him sick. He was so stinky. There he stood there. Oh, my. I can see him straighten that little frail frame up because the Bible said there's no beauty we should desire him. He wasn't very much to look at. See? Just like David. He was chosen king when he's just a little ruddy thing, see? All them great big fellows said, Won't he look pretty with a crown on his head? Take this older son, Jeff said. Samuel said, God refused him. <laughs> Brought all his sons up to him. Got, yeah, we got one, but he wouldn't look like a king. <laughs> Why is the little bitty stoop shouldered, ruddy looking fellow? Go get him. And as soon as he come walk before that prophet, the spirit fell on him. He hey. run with that oil and poured on his head and said, This is your king. That's it. Yes, sir. When Jesus stood there, stoop-shouldered, perhaps, turning gray when he's yet not over 30 years old. The Bible said he might have looked like 40. Jews said, you're a man not over, over 50 years old. And you say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Mm-hmm. Oh, my. St. John 6. Then we come to find out. Yeah, he stood by the grave. He knew that vision had to strike. He knew it had to be. Take away the stone. He, he was thinking... Wrapped in grave clothes. Been dead for four days. His nose had already fell in that much time. There he stood there. Straightened up his little body. I am the resurrection. Man. Mm. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Tell me a man could ever make a statement like that. Amen. Whosoever believeth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe us out of this? He said, yea, Lord. <laughs> though he had failed her, seemingly. When she called, he didn't go. She called again. He didn't go. But here she says, I know that thou art the Christ that was to come into the world. Amen. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah. And a man had been dead for days. Why? What? Christ had the absolute. It saw the vision. It couldn't fail. Amen. That's right. It couldn't fail. He was absolutely sure. And Martha was absolutely sure if she could get him to recognize what she believed in him to be, she'd get what she asked for. Right. There there was the absolute. It tied in with the Word. And that was it. Every man today does in his own sight what he seems good because there is no prophet. Look, in the days of the judges, look at in the days when uh, I believe it was Elijah or Elisha one, yeah, that uh, 
the dead baby, the, the Shunammite woman, she made Elijah was God's man of the day. Not just some good intelligent teacher, but he's an old guy that walked along. Would you just come to, if come to your door today, you'd probably run him away. A whole nation hated him. Jezebel and all the rest of them hated him because she sat in the White House and made all the women do the way she did and all of them patterned after her and, and uh, Ahab was turned, his head was turned by her power. Amen. We haven't missed it too far today. Amen. Just about Amen. the same. And there, there you are. And there's all popularity and all there's all snowed up. But that little old Shunammite, or not Shunammite woman, but little, yes, I believe she was a Shunammite. When she come and seen that that power was in Elijah, she said, I perceive that he's a holy man. Amen. And when that baby was laying dead, she said, saddle that mule and don't you stop. She went up there, she knowed, and I liked that the way she come. She got to her absolute, her time post. Amen. Elijah said, here comes that Shunammite. She's grieving, but I don't know what's wrong. See, God don't show his servants everything, just what he wants them to know. So he said, her heart is grieved, but I don't know. He said, run, find out, Gehazi, and see what's wrong. He said, is all well with thee? Is all well with thy husband? Is all well with thy son? Look at her. Oh, my. This is it. She said, all is well. Amen. Why? She'd come to her absolute. Amen. All is well. And she knelt down, fell first at his feet, and Gehazi raised her up. That's not right before his, his master raised her up. And she began to tell him. Now, he didn't have no absolute now. He knew he had power by the vision to give her the child. But now, what did he do? He took his staff and went out in the room, but shut all the doors, taking everybody else out. He walked up and down the room. He had an absolute if he could only contact it. <laughs> Back and forth, up and down the room. Oh, my. Just he felt something striking. He laid yeah. himself on the baby. Got back up again, went away the the baby kind of moved, got warm. He raised back and forth. He didn't get a good contact with the absolute. <laughs> what was it, Lord? What did you say do? No doubt when he turned, he saw a vision. That little boy run playing, jumping in the rope, something like that, playing. He threw himself upon the baby. He stuck his nose upon its nose, his lips upon its lips. And the power of God raised up the baby. Yeah. Like, what was it? The woman's absolute was the prophet. The prophet's absolute was God. Amen. And together with the Amen. word, I am the resurrection of life. Amen. The creator, Amen. she raised up again the baby. Amen. Sure, reason every man done in his own way, because he had no prophet for the word of the Lord to come to. The word and the prophets was missing in that day. Oh, I seen this at my conversion. <laughs> oh, the day that we lived in. I'm so glad that God got a hold of me before the church did. I'd probably been an infidel. <laughs> Yes, sir. I, all this conglomeration of mess and everybody. Well, come over and join ours. And if you don't, well, you pick up your letter and go join the other. No. Won't you bring your letter into our fellowship? I believe there's one letter. Amen. That's when Christ writes your name on the Lamb's book of life. Right. That's the only one. So, when I've seen all the denominations, our background is Irish, which is formerly Catholic. And I've seen that was corrupt and rotten. I went out to a certain denominational church here in the city. They said, oh, we're the way, the truth, the line. We got all of it. I went to another in New Albany. Oh, my, them guys up there don't know what they're talking about. Catholic said, you're all wrong. I thought, oh, my. I played with a little Lutheran boy, and I thought a little German Lutheran. I went over and I said, uh, where do you go to church at? I go to that church. I went out and I found out they said they were the way. And I went out to Brother Naylor and Emmanuel Baptist, and, or the First Baptist. They said, this is the way. Now I went to Irish church and said, well, this is the way. Oh, I'm so confused. I don't know what to do. But I want to get right. I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how to repent. I wrote a letter. I thought I'd seen him in the woods. I wrote him a letter. I said, dear sir, I know you passed down this path here because I said you're squirrel hunting. I know you come by. I know you're here. I want, you, I want to tell you something. I thought, now wait a minute. I've I never seen anybody. I didn't. I want to talk to them. I, I want to speak with them. Uh, I want to talk to him. And I thought, well, I, I don't know how to do it. And I went out in the shed and knelt down. Water, wet, and little old car sitting there, wrecked up. And I said, I believe I've seen a picture. I believe they put their hands like this. And I got down. And I said, now what am I going to say? 
I said, there's some way you have to do this. Now, I don't know. I know there's a way to approach everything. And I, don't, I said, I put my hands like this. I said, um, dear sir, I wish that you would come and speak with me just a moment. I want to tell you how bad I am. Help my hand like this. I listened. People said, God talked to me. And I know what he did talk because I'd heard it when I was a kid. Tell me not to drink and think. He didn't answer me. I said, maybe I suppose to put my hands like this. So I said, dear sir, uh, I don't know just exactly how to do this, but uh, I trust that you'll, will you help me? And each preacher tell me, come join theirs and stand up and say, they took Jesus Christ and they believe Jesus be the son of God. Devils be the same thing. So I thought, I, I got to have something better than that. So I sat like this. I read where Peter and John passed through the gate called Beautiful and there was a man crippled in the other room. Said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Oh, I know that I didn't have that. <laughs> so I was trying to, to find out how to do it. I didn't know how to pray. I made my hands. Then I laid down like this. Of course, Satan come on the scene then. So you see, you waited too long. You're already 20 years old. There's no need to try it now. You know? Then I got all broke up and started crying. And then when I really got broke up, I said, I'm going to talk. If you don't talk to me, I'm going to talk to you anyhow. So I, I said, I'm no good. I'm ashamed of myself. Mr. God, I know you hear me somewhere. You hear me, and I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed that I have neglected you. About that time, I looked up, and a funny feeling swept over me. Here come a light moving through the room and made a cross. Like that, and a voice that I never heard in my life talk. I looked at it, just cold all over, numb from scared. I couldn't move. I stood looked at it, and it went away. I said, sir, I, I don't understand your language. I said, I, if you can't talk mine... And I, and, and I don't understand yours. And, and if you have, forgive me. I know that I'm supposed to be reckoned in that cross there. Somewhere that my sins are supposed to lay in there. And, and if you will forgive me, just come back and talk in your own language. And I'll understand by that if you can't talk my language. I said, you just let it come back again. And there it was again. Oh, my Amen. goodness. There I got an absolute. Amen. Yes, sir. Felt like a, bi- a load of. Forty tons lifted off my shoulders. I walked down through that boardwalk. Couldn't even touch the ground. Mother said, Billy, you're nervous. I said, no, Mama, I don't know what happened. There's a railroad track back there. I run down that railroad track, jumping up the air just as hard as I could. I didn't know how to give vent to my feelings. Oh, if I'd have known how to shout. <laughs> I was shouting, but in my own way, you see. What was it? I had anchored my soul in a haven of rest. That settled it. That was my absolute. There I'd found something. Not some mythical, some idea. I'd talk with the man. Amen. I'd talk with that man who told me never to drink or smoke or do anything. I would defile myself with women's and so forth. That when I got older, there would be a work for me to do. I'd contacted him. Not the church. I'd contacted him. Yes. Him. Yes, sir. He was the one. Like a fellow down here at the Kiwanis or the... I uh, was speaking not uh, right at the First World War. Brother Funk standing there being a soldier. He said that he was, uh, it's a little kind of sound jokey. There's no place for a joke, but here's what he said. He's here in New Albany. He said, the captain taking us out and said, that whole country there is invested with Japs. Tomorrow, boys, we go in. We got to take them. He said, remember, boys, there's many of us standing here today that won't be there tomorrow. They won't be here tomorrow. We're going in in the morning at daylight. He said, now each one get to his own religion. This guy said, no, I didn't have any religion. And said, I said, I said, I stood there and all the rest of them said, here come a chaplain went this way and a Protestant went this way and a Jewish went this way and a Catholic went that way with their chaplain. Said, I stood there and said, the, the commanding officer said to me, he said, boy, you better get to your religion. He said, I ain't got any. He said, you better be getting some because you're going to need some right away, I'm sure. And said, by that time, he seen a bunch going by and it's Catholic. Said, he walked over and said to this priest, could you give me some religion? And he said, come on. Said he went in and made a Catholic out of me. And there knew all me. There was John Haller and a bunch of them real royal Catholics sitting there, you know, when this guy was telling us. And he said, he said, the next day in the combat, he's talking about, oh, how it was. And said, he's a great big fellow. And he said, they got hand to hand and they're just stabbing with knives and screaming and cutting and slashing. So the lines got twisted up. And they got right around one of them. Jeff let him walk right into it like that. And them big old machine guns are blaring from every side. A hand to hand combat. Said directly, I stopped blowing like this. Said everything screams and carrying on, you couldn't hear yourself. Said, it's blood. He said, Oh, look. And it was my blood. He said, Look here, there's a hole in my side. He said, That was my blood. And said, I, you know, I, I, 
I, <laughs> a real, and Catholic friend, I'm just saying this for, for fun now, but a real royal Catholic said, said, did you say Hail Mary? He said, no, sir. So that was my blood. I didn't want any secretaries. I said, I want to talk to the main man. <laughs> that, was, that was my blood. And I think that's about the way it is. Yes, sir. That's the way it goes. We've got to have a time post, an absolute. I had no time for his secretary. He said, I want to talk to him. Amen. That's it, brother. When a man comes to Christ, you don't want to take some preacher's word, some secretary's word, some something else. You Protestants don't take this, that, or that. Go to that absolute. Until you're anchored there by the new birth being born again and filled with the Holy Ghost and you see the Bible being manifested in humility and love through your life. Oh, then that's your absolute. Yes, sir. I read in the Word where He is the Word. <coughs> when the German church said it's this way and the Methodist and the Baptist and the Catholic, but I read in the Word where He said, up on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. Listen, now I'm closing. Now the Protestant says, now the Catholic says, he built it up on Peter. Thou art Peter and upon this rock. No, he never. If it was, it backslid right away. And they built it up on a man. What did he do? The Protestant said he built it up on himself. No, he did not. He didn't build it up on himself. What did he do? What do, who does man say, I, the son of man, am? And some said, Thou art Elias and Moses. He said, But what do you say? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Watch the words now. Blessed are thou, Simon, son of Jonas. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You never learned it but some priest. You never learned it but some seminary. But my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed it to you. And upon this rock, spiritual revelation of the Word, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. I thought, Lord, that's it. I read over here in the book of Revelations, 21st chapter, 22nd chapter, where he said, whosoever, this is a complete thing, whosoever shall inject something to it, whosoever shall take something away from it, deny its soul, or whosoever shall try to make it a little better and polish it up for the day, whosoever shall add to or take away, the same will be taking his part out of the book of life. I said, then that's all I need, Lord, is to believe this. And in this, that cross, under the Christ came, it's perfect. All the way, every word that he ever said, take the book in this hand, the history in this hand, and this vindicates right straight down, it's perfect. And I said, then, Lord, receive me. And when I did, I received Christ, the Holy Spirit, in my heart, my absolute. It hasn't been me I was sick one time when my, I lost my wife. I lost my baby. Lo, oh, lost my father and lost my brother and lost my sister-in-law. And Billy was laying dying and, and I was just about gone. I was going up the road crying, going to her grave. I heard a baby and a baby on her arm going to the grave. I was walking up. Mr. Eisler used to come here and play, you know, the state senator of India. He's come up the road. He stopped me right out there and put his arms around me. He's after the 37 flood. He said, where are you going, Billy? Up there? And I said, yep. He said, what are you going to do up there? I said, I'll listen to an old dove. I said, I'll sit there by the baby's grave and hers. An old dove comes down there and he speaks to me. Oh, he said, Billy. And I said, yeah, and I hear the whispering of the leaves when they play. It, it plays music for me, Mr. Eisler. I said, what kind of music does it play? He said, there's a land beyond the river that they call that sweet forever. And we only reach that shore by faith. One by one we gain the portal. There to dwell with the immortal when someday they'll ring them golden bells for you and me. He said, Billy, I want to ask you something. He said, what does Christ mean to you now? What does Christ mean to you now? I said, he's my life, my all. He's all that I have, Mr. Eisler. He's my, my ultimate. He's all that I can hold to. Why? There would have been something happened. Upon this rock. I said, I've seen you standing around the corner and preach till you look like you're going to drop dead. I've seen you all hours and night up and down the streets making sick calls. And after you tuck your own wife and your own baby, you still serve him. I said, if he slays me, yet I trust him. Amen. Why? My anchor holds within the veil. I had an absolute. I tied myself to his word and his word was holding. He is my absolute. I found out and all these other things may fail, but Christ can never fail. 
The Catholic Church has the Pope for an absolute. The Protestant has their bishops and their creeds and their general overseers. But I like Paul. Got your pencil. Sit down something. And Paul said in Acts, the 20th chapter and the 24th verse, none of these things move me. Amen. Amen. Oh, you can have the creeds. You can have whatever you want to. But them things don't move me. I've anchored my soul in a haven of rest. Amen. The sail, the wild seas, I don't know where you're at, this way, that way, no more. The tempest may sweep over the wild stormy deep, all may turn down, but in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, none of these things move me. For I'm tied to an anchor. Oh, since I met him, Paul said on that road, I've been tied to an anchor. He turned me around. He started me back right. Remember, Paul belonged to an organization too, the biggest in the land. But he got tied to the absolute. Listen, I'll tell you something. He had a purpose in saving me. He had a purpose in saving you. And I am determined by his will to do it. Not to add to it or take away from it. Revelation 22, 19, if you want to put that down. All right. Whosoever take away. I'm determined. I'm fixing to leave the church and you know that. And so I'm determined to remain with this gospel as long as I live by the help of God. <laughs> Remember, here's grace. There were millions dying in sin when he saved me. Amen. Who was I that he should save? He had a purpose in saving me. Amen. And I'm determined to carry out that purpose. Amen. I don't care. It may be my end maybe pretty soon now. My Lord. But whatever it is, I'm still anchored. Never changed it. Mr. Eisler said to me that day going up the road, he said, Billy, in all this trouble, did you keep your religion? I said, no, sir. It kept me. Amen. My anchor held. That's right. I never kept it. It kept me. I can't keep it. There's no way for me to do it, but it keeps me. That's yes, right. He had a purpose in saving me. There were millions in sin when I come to him, but he saved me. He had a purpose in doing so. Christ's death was an absolute to the fear of it. Christ's death settled the question. Amen. When that bee of death stung him and anchored that stinger, you know, a bee, an insect that has a stinger, if it ever anchors that stinger into deep enough, when it pulls away, it pulls a stinger out of it. Death always had a stinger. Death always had a stinger. One day when that blowing up Calvary and the bumping of them rocks, the blood splashing up on the rocks. When he hit the dirt on Calvary going to Golgotha, the back of that cross was dragging out the bloody footprints of that little frail body going marching along there. And them whipping and mashing him as he went up the hill. But he had an absolute. He knew where he stood because the word of God said to David, I'll not leave my Holy One to see corruption, neither will I leave his soul in hell. And he knew corruption set in in 72 hours. He said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. He had an absolute. Amen. Now he go up the hill with gobs of mockery, spit of drunken soldiers that put a rag around his face and hit him on the head and said, your prophets tell us who hit you. There he's going up the hill in shame and disgrace to be his clothes stripped from him, despising the shame. Hanging on the cross before the people, naked. Dying in Roman disgrace under government capital punishment. A man that had done nothing. A little story one time said, Mary Magdalena ran out and said, What has he done? Healed your sick, raised the dead, and brought deliverance to those that were in captive. What has he done? And a priest smacked her in the mouth through the blood flew out and said, Would you listen to her or your high priest? Oh, that denominational world. It's a curse of all of it. That's it. There it is. They took him on. But he went up the hill, dragging. The devil had always doubted it, him being what he was. Amen. said, if thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. You claim you can do miracles if you are the Son of God. Command these stones to be turned to bread. That same old devil lives today. Yeah. That's right. If you are a divine healer, here's old John so-and-so sitting here on the corner. I know he's crippled. Heal him. Don't you know it's that same old devil? Amen. Jesus said, I only do. Look, he went through the pool of Bethesda where thousands lay there, lame, blind, halt, and withered, and went to a man that could walk. He could get around. He might have had prostrate trouble. Whatever it was, it was retarded. He had it 38 years. He said, when I'm coming to the pool, someone steps ahead of me. He can walk. 
left all them laying there and went to that very one and healed him. Why? He said he knew he had been in that shape. Then they said to him, questioned him. When they found St. John 5, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. There is his absolute. That's still the absolute. Amen. Standing on her in Finland that day, and that little boy laying there, and I walked around him laying there dead, been dead for a half hour. You read in the book, I started to walk away, something put their hands on, I turned around. Oh, what was that? And I looked again. I thought, wait a minute. Look back here on the fly of the the Bible, and it shall come to pass a little boy about nine years old. He'll be killed by an automobile. There'll be a long strip of evergreen rocks lapped in there. The car will be laying across the road wreck. He'll have on little stockings like up high, a crock haircut. His little eyes will be turned back. The bones in his body will be broken. I look at the Lord. Oh, God! I said, stand still, all of you. The mayor of the city there. I said, if that boy isn't on his feet in two minutes from now, I'm a false prophet. Ride and run me out of Finland. Certainly. But if he is... You owe your lives to Christ. That's right. They stood still. I said, Heavenly Father, across the sea, hundred or two years ago, you said this little boy lay here. There was Brother Moore and Brother Lindsay. I'm looking at that and they were wearing the road in the Bible. And thousands of Bibles across the land have it wrote in. What was it? An absolute. The Father had shown what would take place. There was no fear at all. Stand there. Absolute. Sure. He arrived. Right there in Finland where thousands of people coming in nightly and have to even move some out and let them speak them, move them out and put somebody else in. There he stood with all that the people loved and had seen healings done. But here was a boy laying there dead. What was the absolute? The vision. I do what the Father says do. He that believeth in me, the works that I do, shall he also. There's your absolute. I said, Death, you can't hold him any longer. God has spoken. Come back, get him up. And the little boy raised up and looked around like that. The people got to fainting and everything. There it is, wrote right there and signed by the mayor Amen. of the city. Well, by a notary republic. That's right. What is it? An absolute. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If that ain't the same God that stopped the woman from nailing with the barrier with her son. When anyone died in them days, they immediately put him in the grave. They didn't let him lay over. They put him in the grave. There's that same Jesus Christ yesterday, Amen. today, and forever. Yeah. Look down there in Mexico and that little baby. Some of you laying here, sitting here, and that baby, the doctor signed a statement. wrote in the Christian businessman. That baby died that morning at 9 o'clock, and this is 10 o'clock that night. And that little woman would not be comforted. Billy, standing there, my son, trying to put her back. And they had, well, they, I guess they had 200 ushers stand there. And she climbed over them the night before that blind man received his sight. And she knew it was just Catholic. And finally, I said, go, Brother Moore, and pray for her because that baby, that's raining, pouring down. They've been standing there since early that morning out in that big bull ring. And I said, let me down on ropes behind to get into the place. Just there for three nights. I stood there and I said, you know, as I was saying, uh, preaching, and look, I seen a little baby out here in front of me. A little Mexican baby, no teeth. They're sitting there laughing at me right here in front of me. I said, wait a minute, Brother Moore. Bring her here. Oh, <laughs> Absolute. The ushers cleared back. Here she comes. She fell down and said, Padre, Padre. I said, stand up. And Brother Espinosa said, stand up. And he told her in Spanish. She stood up there. I said, Heavenly Father, I'm standing here in this rain. The pretty little woman, about 23 years old, something like that. Her hair hanging down. Her little face looking up like that. Looking in her eyes, expectation. She'd seen that man that had been totally blind for about 40 years. His eyes come open on the platform. She knew if God could open blind her eyes, he could heal her baby. Amen. There she lay there, a little stiff thing laying under her blanket like that. And it's soaking wet. She'd been standing there all morning and all afternoon too. There was about 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock that night, something like that, holding that baby out. you seen the article in Christian Business, man? They're holding that baby like that. I said, Heavenly Father, I do not know what this means. I'm just your servant. But I seen that baby standing there. It was alive. I lay my hands upon it in the name of the Lord. Jesus said, Mwah! and began to cry. The mother grabbed the baby and started screaming. And up people started screaming out there and women fainting and things. I said, Don't you say nothing about that. Send a runner with that baby with that mother and go to that doctor and let him sign a statement that that baby died and died with pneumonia the morning before that and, or that morning at 9 o'clock and we got the signed statement by the doctor the baby was pronounced dead in the doctor's office that morning and the mother packed it around all day what was it? an absolute 
What was it? She believed if God could open blinded eyes. Amen. God could raise the dead. For He's the same yesterday today and forever. I wasn't sure. I didn't know till I seen Him. And when I saw the baby, it was an absolute, absolutely right. There it was. Death has to give up its victim. Here went the Son of God. That bee of death began to buzz around him. Ah, how could he be a prophet? How could he stand there and let spit in his face? How could he stand there and let them make fun of him and not do something about it? That is Emmanuel. That's just an ordinary man. Look at the drunken slobbers and them drunken soldiers. Look at his face bleeding. The devil said, I'll get him. I'll get him. Here he come like a bee, the sting of death, buzzing around him. But brother, when that bee ever anchored its stinger in that Emmanuel, when he come out, he lost his stinger. Amen. Amen. Even death itself. No wonder Paul later could look in the face of him and say, Oh, death, where is your stinger? Amen. Grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory. Christ's death was the absolute to every man that feared it. My heart says amen to every word in his book. I'm closing amen. sure enough now. I just got to cut this off. See? That's why I know the Holy Spirit is my compass that guides me. He is the one that makes me know this word is true. He is my absolute. He is my sunshine. He is my life. He is my anchor. When troubles are on, He is my north star. Hallelujah. When I'm lost, the Holy Spirit is my compass. It guides me back to the place. Denominations are like other stars. They shift with the world. Other stars shift as the world shifts, but not the North Star. Amen. The world can shift where it wants to, but it stays put. Oh, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The North Star is anchored. Amen. The others shift around. You can see them here and there and everywhere else. That's with the denominational churches. Hallelujah. But Christ is the absent. Amen. He's the one you can put confidence in. When your denomination's got you all twisted up, just look to the North Star. The Holy Spirit is your compass. He ever remains true to His Word. When they told me that them things couldn't happen in a modern day like this, I know if, if, there, if there is no God, then live, eat, drink, and be merry. If there is a God, let's serve Him. Amen. And I've lived to see the day that He has performed everything, even to raising the dead when He was here on earth. And we know that, but documented statement. That it is the truth. Yes, sir. He is my absolute. Now make him your absolute. Take in the in time of my trouble. He's always the absolute. Now watch. By the grace of God. Now I just better close. It's getting late. Well, look here. I thought it was 11 o'clock. It's 1230. Friends. All day, all night, all year, and all to eternity could never speak of it. Amen. Don't try to figure it out. You can't. There's no way of figuring it out. You say, Brother Bram, if, if you, I don't know. I just believe. I quit trying to do anything about it. I just believe it. That's all. Amen. Not him that runneth or him that willeth. It's God shows mercy. Amen. See? <laughs> Not by works. It's by grace. Amen. I just believe it. God, it's up to Him to do the rest of it. Just believe it. Act upon it. This famous song, I heard him play a sing it here or somewhere. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure. Amen. How fabulous and strong. It shall forevermore endure saints and angels' song. When a man in mathematics tried to break down or tried to show by his education, it'll run you crazy. You can't do it. Don't try to do it. Don't try to figure it out. God's past figuring out. Amen. You don't figure God out. You just believe God. Amen. That's the that's secret. Don't figure it out. Just believe it. I can't tell you what it means. I can't tell you how to do it. I just know I just believe it. That's all. Just like you promise something to a little kid, he believes it. You should keep your word. You're God's child. He keeps his word. Just simply believe it. Don't be shook up. Just stay right there. God did it one time, He has to do it again. If He don't, He'll tell you why He can't do it. That's right. Now, just stay right with it. You know that one verse?
verse there, I believe our precious brother there is baptized last night, sings that song, Oh, love of God. They tell me that that verse, this part of it, was found pinned on an insane institution's wall. When it said, If we with ain't the ocean fill, or were the skies a parchment made, and ever stalk on earth a quill, and ever man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Or could the scroll retain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky? Think of it. What about three-fourths of the earth is water? And look at uh, the hydrogen and oxygen in the air. The humidity and stuff. See, if every moisture was ink, and think of the billions and trillions and trillions of straws, which would be quills. And think of the billions of men that's been on earth and every one of them a scribe by trade to dip their pins into the ocean and try to figure out the love of God would drain the ocean dry. Amen. Amen. Or could the scroll contain the whole ocean from eternity to eternity? Hallelujah. Don't figure it out. You can't. You lose your mind trying to figure it out. Just believe it. Make him your absolute. Stay there for sweet peace and an experience that you'll never forget. Hallelujah. Anchor to that. And your anchor will hold within the day. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> How great thou art. How great thou art. How many in here with your heads bowed this morning? It's approaching New Year's now. And you've been very religious. And that's good. I appreciate it. Everyone did. I'm sure God does. But you really haven't had that absolute experience. That's something that you just didn't make believe. You just didn't imagine. But something spoke back to you. And then you've seen your life change from that time. And every word of God. Every promise is punctuated with an amen. Then you're holding to the absolute. Because you remember, he said, if heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not fail. Uh, you haven't come to that place yet where you can say amen to every word. If it was against your creed, if it was against your denomination, but you want to come to that place like Moses, like the rest of them, that could not do that until they caught that absolute. And you want it in your life this morning. Would you just signify the same by just lifting your hands to God? God bless you. Oh, that's all of the building. Gracious Father, I know that sometime we must part. There's got to be a time that when we're going to leave this world. We don't know what time that is. And it doesn't make too much difference. If our time is finished, then we want to come. Our objective of staying here is to serve you. And since on the road to destructions one day, as Paul was on the road to Damascus to make havoc of the church, a light blinded him. And oh God, that light followed him. For it was Christ. And he anchored there to an absolute that even death itself, he could laugh in the face of it and say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. You become a complete absolute to that apostle. He was the, you were the amen to him in every sentence. You were the star of his life, the guidepost. You were the compass that guided him through the storm. You were the revelation. You were the vision. You were his hopes, his salvation. And even at the hour of death, when he knew he was going to it, you were still his absolute. You were Daniel's absolute. You were all the prophets' absolute. In the midst of the denominational difference and the troubles of their days and the Pharisees and Sadducees, still, 
There was man who took you for their absolute. And today, Lord, men and women with compassion, with love, and, and hearts that are bleeding, Lord, for a real experience of knowing God and to have a, an assurance of an absolute. Maybe all the people ever know before, Lord, was to join the church. And we realize that I have tried to sincerely not to be different. You know my heart. But tell them that you cannot join the church. You join the lodge. The Methodist and Baptist and Catholic and Pentecostal lodges. But you're born into the church. The mythical body of Christ. And become members of His body. With the gifts of the Spirit to make His great Body move in action and power. God, that's what these hands meant this morning when they went up. Place me, O Lord. Take me, mold me, make me. Just make my position in life such an absolute, tied to Christ, that I'll think of nothing else but that absolute. Grant it, Lord. Bless them. Heal the sick and afflicted. Save the lost. Now, Lord, we know it's customary to call to the altar the people. But that has become a tradition to us. And this morning with the altars filled and the the little children and and all, but Lord, somehow you spoke to them. They raised up their hands. They made they made as it was a decision. They want to. They 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 want something real. And I'm offering my prayer in their behalf. Grant it to each one, Lord. Be with us now, forgiving our sins healing our sickness and giving us the deliverance that we need. And Lord, above all things, may we never forget today that we are tied to the absolute. Our North Star to Calvary, to Christ, and the Holy Spirit is taking the words of God and making them manifest literally to us by healing the sick, showing us visions, raising the dead, and doing just exactly what He promised to do. And may this church and these people are the portion of the body of Christ that's assembled here this morning live like Jesus said to them, Ye are the salt of the earth. And may they become so salty till their community will be thirsty. Salt creates a thirst. And salt can only save as it contacts And I pray, God, that you'll grant this to the people, that they might be soul winners also. Bless our pastor, Brother Neville, this humble servant, Lord, standing at his post of duty just as reverent as a member of the body of Christ, trying his very best to follow everything that you'd tell him to do. Bless the trustees, that man who stood with me so gracious in this great dark time that I've been through. Stand with the church who prayed with me and stood by me in times of trouble. Lord, I love them and I offer my prayer that they will look to you, Lord. May they look away from this mortal clay of a servant. May they look to him who is the omnipotent, who is. And we know, Lord, that we are finite. No matter who we are, we're still mortal. But not the messenger, but the message. Grant it, Lord. That's where we point to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Grant that He'll be so real to everyone here today, even to the little children, that He'll become the absolute of the entire congregation. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. I love Him. we sing it again. Shake hands with somebody in front of you, back of you, side of you. Just everybody shake hands now. Just remain seated. Just turn around and shake hands if you can. See? I...
They just announced communion Monday night at midnight. Let's raise our hands now and sing to him. How many, how many fields you, he is your absolute. The word, he is the word. Do you believe that? He is the word. And the Holy Spirit germatized that word to make that life live in you of the word. The vindication of the word. Put the word in your heart. Let the Holy Spirit come in and watch the Word move. Believe. Be humble. Don't desire to be a great somebody. Be a nobody that God can make you somebody. See? All right. Do that now. Everybody, love Him. Say amen. 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 You know what the word amen means? So be it. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Let's say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what that means? Praise our God. When I was in Germany not long ago, I got up before about thirty or 40,000 people out there that day. And I said, it's a strange thing that you German people can't understand. I said, on my road down here today, a dog barked at me in English. <laughs> That's right. I said, he had no trouble at all. And there sat a bird and he sang for me in English. I come down the street and a mother had a little baby on her arm. And I come in back out the back. And I said, that baby was crying in English. What's the matter with you people? <laughs> That's right. Oh, if you just look around, he's everywhere, isn't he? Sure he is. Now let's just raise our hands and close our eyes and sing while we ask the pastor to come up for dismissing. Let's stand up first. Everybody on your own feet. Hallelujah. Everybody. Do you love him again now? Say, Amen. 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 And you know the word hallelujah is the same in every dialect. Go in the hot and hot jungles of Africa. Hallelujah is the same word. Hallelujah. It ought to almost be a Christian salutation. Yeah, <laughs> hallelujah. The word means praise our God. And he's worthy of it, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's absolutely my Savior. He's absolutely Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to me. He's absolutely the same yesterday, today, and forever to me. Is he that way to you? Ah.